Hello, I'm Chairman Don Palmer with the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. And I'm Vice Chair Thomas X. May is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. As part of the EAC's recognition of this month, we have the pleasure of hosting a panel focused on election language services and assisted programs for the AAPI community. With us today, we have uh, Shabana Burma, the director of the Southeast Asian Outreach for the Chicago Board of Election Commissioners. We also have L Loretta Pertillo, assistant registrar of voters for Clark County, Nevada, Heider Garcia, who's the election administrator for Tarrant County, Texas, and Scott Konopasek, director of the Office of Elections and the general registrar for Fairfax County, Virginia. Thank you all for joining us today and, and giving us your insights. Um, I guess I'll do the first question um, and really I'll start, uh, I, I guess with Shabana and let's, uh, and then we'll have everybody else, uh, you know, please give your input. Can you talk about the Asian American or Pacific Islander minority language communities that are in your locality and how you serve the AIPI community? Sure. Um, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, thank you, first of all, for having me today. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you all and be able to share some thoughts, um, especially as we celebrate this important month. Um, I'd like to start with um, some national data for context. Um, for example, uh, according to a recent uh, Pew report, uh, our country's Asian American population went from 11.9 million in 2000 to 23, uh, over 23 million in 2019. And they currently make up to about 7% of the US population. So as the third largest metropolitan area, after New York and LA, um, the Chicago metropolitan area is home to the fifth largest Asian American population in the country, uh, with more than 80% uh, of Asian Americans in Illinois residing in Chicagoland. So um, this diverse and one of the fastest growing ethnic communities uh, nationally, over 5 million are of South Asian descent and Asian Indians comprise the largest segment of the South Asian American community here, uh, making up to over 75% of the total population. Um, also followed by then Pakistanis and Bangladeshis and Nepalis, uh, Sri Lankans and Bhutanese. So speaking of a community so diverse and large, um, we also need to respect the diversity of our communities and take into account the growing needs and challenges of these immigrant communities. Uh, we understand there are a variety of unmet needs uh, among this population, uh, including the lack of culturally and uh, linguistically appropriate services or programs, uh, but we are fortunate to bridge some of that gap um, <clears throat> through our language access or voter engagement program at the Chicago Board of Elections. Uh, we provide language assistance to voters with limited proficiency in English in select precincts. Um, and this includes, and of course it's not limited to, but it includes making sure we have all the election related instructional uh, and informational materials um, available in um, Hindi. Uh, we also have a Chinese uh, that we provide language access in. Uh, we recruit bilingual poll workers who assist voters in Hindi, Chinese, Urdu, Gujarati, Korean, and Tagalog uh, at polling places on election day. Um, and we do a lot of media outreach as well. So of course, this is, you know, this all requires and depends upon uh, trusted relationships, um, partnerships, communication, collaborations we have developed over the years, uh, which need to be maintained throughout the year. Um, through continued strategic partnership with our communities. Um, for example, we work year round uh, with community partner groups, including uh, a lot of community-based organizations, uh, aid-based centers, student groups, and media, et cetera. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's an undertaking, but it's really rewarding to be able to do the work that we are able to do here. Thank you. Uh, Lorena, tell us a little bit about Clark County, Nevada's outreach. Sure, yes, outreach is a big part of what we do here in Clark County and with the AAPI um, community. We have a longstanding community partnership. We also have partnerships with wonderful organizations such as ACDC, uh, NAFA. Uh, we also uh, work very closely with Las Vegas Asian Journal to promote 
registration and of course voting here in Clark County. Um, we received the census data in 2011 and we began to um, provide election materials and voting in Tagalog in 2012. And therefore, we uh, also provide at the polls. Uh, we are required to have at least two at certain designated areas and polling sites uh, in order to reach out to voters when they're at the polls. But also here in the office, we are uh, we have dedicated staff that not only translates but answers our hotline uh, for Tagalog speakers that would like to uh, reach out to us in their language. Um, available throughout the working office hours. So it, it, it's a big collaboration. Uh, we even um, began to, uh, on our own, without uh, it being a requirement, to begin translating materials in Chinese. We know the census data is still not here and we don't have it available, but because our community partners are so close with us, they've you know, let us know pretty much what the needs are and so we've, uh, we, in 2020, we did um, translate in Chinese Mandarin some of our informational uh, flyers in, uh, so we can provide uh, that information of how to vote, what's new in Nevada, in the language that seems to be uh, more popular now than ever. So our Tagalog speakers, although there are few, uh, currently we have uh, a little under 600 that requested their uh, materials in Tagalog. We know for a fact there's many more uh, out there. So we uh, work with our community leaders to ensure we are, you know, contributing to the needs. So we go out for voting machine demonstrations. Uh, we go to registration events. We have them coming in as field registrars. So we provide training to the different organizations. So. Um, we, we definitely uh, need to continue that communication, and they've been wonderful partners. Uh, they're very passionate, as we are, so uh, we get along very, very well. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, Hyder, it's been a while since we I was able to visit your offices. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about Tarrant County's uh, communities and how you serve them? Well, Tarrant County, um, we have a very large community of Vietnamese um, speakers and Vietnamese descendants, uh, mostly in the south uh, east area, the Arlington and the Mansfield region. Um, we started a few years ago being uh, having the need to, to provide all the information in Vietnamese, um, starting with the basics, right? Like all the signs being translated, all the materials handed out, the website. So uh, there was a huge effort. It hasn't been a long time. It's been uh, three, four years since that started here in Tarrant County. We do expect this to increase once we get the new census data. Um, it's no secret that, you know, Texas is one of the states that is attracting uh, a lot of people from states like California, where there are already large um, communities of uh, AAPI. And so we expect that, we expect to see some of that happening next year. Um, we, one of our also biggest challenges was when we moved to vote centers, because when the, the requirement for handling materials of Vietnamese started, uh, at least election day materials were very concentrated in the area where people, you know, uh, resided and voted and how this is all determined with the data, right, on, on, on the demographics. But when we went vote centers and people could start going anywhere in the county, we immediately had to start providing those services at every location in the county, regardless of, of, of where the population that, that had the language needs was concentrated. And so um, part of the efforts that we had to undertake were recruiting bilingual poll workers for every location and one of, of our, uh, every single one of our 340 locations countywide. Um, luckily, we have found a lot of people um, that are not only fluent in Vietnamese and willing to work, but willing to work in locations that are far away from their uh, residents, right? So if, if you live in the southeast corner of Tarrant County uh, and we have a polling place open in the northwest corner, completely opposite, an hour, more than an hour drive, um, you know, we, we feel that we're very fortunate and it shows the level of commitment of the community of saying, you know, I'll go and I'll work that side of the county to make sure that if someone shows up that needs a service, um, we're there to provide it. Um, we have staff, permanent staff in the office that is fluent in Vietnamese. We are actually on our next budget cycle uh, looking for, hopefully, if it's approved, another position 
so that when uh, voters who speak Vietnamese call us, they have someone who can answer the phone um, and speak to them in a fluent uh, native way, you know, um, so that they can understand and, and, and communicate well. Um, that will be a challenge, obviously, and I would, one of the things we have in our, on our um, to-do list is to reach out to communities that have, counties that have a more diverse and more languages to serve, to learn how you do this when we have, you know, 10, 12 languages to deal with. I mean, <laughs> to grow overnight into expanding your staff into 12 positions that, that I don't think that's probably the way we're gonna go. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear in experiences of um, providing services in multiple and, and, and a lot of languages, basically. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Hyder. Uh, Scott Kumpasak, uh, you're in my own stomping grounds in Virginia. Tell us a little bit about the communities that you serve and, and uh, sort of how you do that. So <clears throat> my experience is both here in Fairfax County, Virginia, where I recently uh, uh, assume this position, uh, but also on, in California where I uh, worked for, for many years. So uh, I, I will talk a little bit about both experiences. Uh, here in Fairfax, the interesting thing is, uh, I'll point out that Fairfax County is demographically almost identical to Contra Costa County in Northern California where I previously worked. The population's the same, the, uh, the demographics and, and uh, uh, ethnic makeup is, is very similar. Uh, here in Fairfax County, uh, we have large populations of Korean speakers and Vietnamese speakers. Uh, in California, uh, in Contra Costa, we had uh, Vietnamese, Tagalog, and Korean speakers, and Chinese. Uh, some of those languages are covered by uh, Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act, and there were specific requirements to that we needed to fulfill to serve the needs of those voters. But one of the things that became obvious to me was there are language needs uh, out there for populations that don't meet the uh, 203 thresholds. And we tend to focus a lot of our language assistance just on the, those populations that have met that 203 threshold. So uh, one of the things that we uh, uh, try to do is to pre prepare and translate uh, election materials and ballots into those non-203 languages to be able to provide a larger service. And like Hyder explained, uh, when uh, before we had voting centers or early voting opportunities or widespread vote by mail, uh, we, we knew where those populations were concentrated. So we could kind of focus our efforts and our materials that we prepared to serve communities. But uh, as things changed, we realized that there's a larger community that may not be served by that. So we went from uh, uh, providing translations of ballots locally uh, to having a composite ballot uh, for the entire county translated into uh, our target languages. And that met a larger need uh, across the county and it wasn't, uh, the service was no longer geographically based. Uh, and to a logical extension, once we got uh, some new voting technology and uh, ballot marking devices, uh, we said, since we're translating the ballots already, why don't we put all the ballots on uh, in an official form on our ballot marking devices and allow voters to actually vote the ballot in their in their preferred language and that, that was very very successful and uh, the great thing about it was voters were, were able to select their language uh, in private they didn't have to disclose so they could toggle back and forth to English and a target language and it was it was very very well received so uh, keeping in mind that there are populations that don't meet those thresholds that we typically think of, uh, is, I think is really important. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Vice Chair Hayes, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I want to expand upon Scott's answer there and um, go to how do you reach communities with limited English proficiency to ensure participation in the voting process? Particularly, how have you made changes in how you recruit poll workers and uh, get communities involved in the process? Um, we, if you want to, this Hyder, Hyder, we can start with you. Sure. I think um, part of it is just 
it sounds simple, but it's being out there. It's understanding where those community events happen. And, and it may, you know, not all solutions have to be complicated. It may be as simple as just having a table with registration forms and, and people, you know, at the little local arts events, fair events, um, uh, the little, you know, the, the, the social events that happen in these communities and say, okay, we're here to talk about this. We're here to uh, find those people who have, you know, that, that will to, to, to express those needs, right? And, and understand if we are, in fact, um, reaching out in a proper way, right? Do they, things as basic as, you know, do you know, uh, do you know the process? Do you know the elections that are coming up? Do you know our website? Um, have you used our website? And when you do, do you use it in the language that you uh, prefer and, and how good is it, right? Um, are we Google translating too much or are we actually sounding uh, fluid and, and, and coherent to you? Uh, those, those kinds of questions, right? So I think that's that's number one. And then identifying local um, in the language community media. You know, um, you don't you don't hit these communities necessarily with the mainstream media, but you can find a lot of uh, local uh, on the counter, smaller news prints that are used in the community, and just insert yourself there, and and you know at least again make a presence noted and say hey here's who we are and here's our reach out to us if you have questions or if you you know, we you feel that we need to provide a better service. So I would definitely point to those two. I think they're very um, effective strategies to, to go out and, and find uh, a way to get into the community and capture their needs. Great, 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 great. Lorena? Yes, I agree with all the folks on the forum. It is very important to have that community outreach we have solutions, but we have to know how to apply them. And the community leaders and the organizations are the best folks to tell us, you know, how to do that and who uh, to target, how to target the information they need from us to go out there in the communities. Um, and so we meet um, as, as frequent as they want, but for sure at least once or twice before each election. It's important for us to be on the same page know the dates, know what's coming up, what's new, new legislative changes. They need to be able to uh, translate it to their partners as well. And, it, you know, social media is used quite a bit, so it, it's important that the message is clear. Uh, public speaking forums are held uh, whenever they request us to do so. Uh, we have an outreach calendar that uh, not only do we wait for them to call us, but we have a list of contacts that we are now that you know COVID restrictions have subsided. We are going to be calling out to them and asking them, "Do you need us to go out there and talk to your community?" We will be happy to either through social media, in person, at events. We've gone to several events. Some they just want a public speaker. Some they want both public speaking and voting machines. But in essence. It's, uh, it's up to the community and we need to listen to their needs. And it's important because um, we've listened to their needs as far as um, a Korean speaking, Vietnamese speaking, going back to, although it's not required in the 2020 general, we made the utmost effort to bring on in office and at the polls, various uh, Korean and Vietnamese speakers, just in case we had Chinese speakers in, in office because the community was telling us, hey, you know, we need this uh, for folks to call in and be able to answer, uh, to get the answers uh, they need in their language. So it, it's important to listen to them. Great, great. Shabona? Yeah, um, ditto to everything that's been said already. Um, every election is a significant undertaking, right? So. Um, there can be thousands of styles of ballots, you know, both on paper, electronic. Uh, we also uh, make sure that our um, ballots are, uh, so in Chicago, as we were talking about targeted outreach, we have 50 wards and out of those 50 wards, you know, we have 2069 precincts. So with those precincts, we have 56 precincts that are identified um, for assistance, for example, uh, in Hindi, that's covered under Section 203 of the Federal mm -hmm. Voting Rights Act. And uh, so we make sure that ballots are available in Hindi. Um, there are materials on registration, word by mail, early voting, election day voting, our website, uh, you know, we make sure that there's a lot of in-house translation. In fact, all of it 
because we try to avoid any kind of shortcut because then it would rather do a disservice to our voters um, in terms of quality, um, given the, you know, how technical all of the language and um, the vocabulary is. So we want to make sure that we are serving our community right. Um, it's an year-round process, you know, engagement. I know it was challenging um, given the pandemic and lockdown, but we still administered uh, two elections during that time. So we've also learned some lessons. For example, you know, it's one thing to put together all of the materials and ballots, you know, in certain language or multiple languages. But I think the key is constant outreach and engagement, as Lorna said, that we have to uh, pay attention to the feedback from the community. We have to continuously engage with them. We have event calendars. Uh, we check in with our community members in terms of making sure that we are able to take over election equipment for demonstration. Uh, and uh, why that's important is because we know that you know, at least I can speak with the South Asian community that I um, definitely, you know, work with, um, there are over 65% uh, voters uh, of the total of, I would say, over 5 million South Asians in the United States uh, that are eligible to vote and a huge, you know, or a sizable number of those voters are not proficient in English. So when we're looking at voters who have language barriers, um, you know, just providing translated materials may not be the ideal approach without that trust that we need to build in the community, without that engagement and outreach that we need to do to make sure that we're able to increase voter participation, which is our ultimate goal. And um, so we have uh, language assistance at polling places. We have, uh, we try to have at least two people speaking the language because sometimes we have last minute, uh, you know, either cancellations or, you know, resignations or no shows on election day for various reasons. So we want to make sure that, you know, we try to have some cushion there whenever possible. Um, and besides the materials, I think besides the translation procedures, I think uh, what is more also more important is our engagement um, in terms of not just focusing on voter registration because poll workers also required are also required um, to be registered voters in Chicago or Cook County, uh, unless they're students. But uh, we have now realized that that level of engagement uh, has informed us that having a bilingual poll worker at a polling place wearing a language assistance badge where people can then be directed to those voters having paper ballots uh, at the desk, uh, having polling place signage and at least in Chicago, we have them in English, Spanish, Chinese, and Hindi. Uh, we also have additional language assistance uh, in certain, you know, select precincts in Tagalog and Korean. We also have uh, ballots in these languages at every election equipment that we have at polling places. So that covers pretty much 2069 precincts. Um, you know, as discussed earlier, that it's it, it's hard to limit our services to a certain radius or a certain precinct. So uh, having the ballots uploaded on our electronic equipment uh, helps us provide uh, language services across the city. We also have hotlines that people can call and speak to someone who speaks their language. Uh, on election day, we have a language desk where we have people speaking multiple languages to receive calls from all across the city uh, in, uh, in those particular languages, despite the fact that we do have ballots, you know, both paper and uh, electronic. We do have poll workers. Uh, we also make sure that uh, we have uh, people receiving those calls on election day. Uh, we also have audio ballots. So our electronic equipment also mm -hmm. has ballots recorded in these languages um, so that people who may have certain other challenges can also put their headphones on and uh, still be able to vote um, in, in their preferred language. So, you know, it's, it's critical um, why we need to engage our voters. We work with community leaders, you know, uh, recruiting poll workers constantly requires also engaging with other city agencies. Um, we try to partner with organizations, research groups, you know, to make sure that we also have the data. We're working with media. Always, you know, definitely focusing on <clears throat> ethnic media, but also with mainstream media to make sure that the message gets across so that we're all aware of the diversity of our community and the challenges some of us may be facing. Uh, we work with a lot of Cal college campuses because we work with a lot of youth. Um, we work with university administrators, faculty, students, uh, a lot of high schools, um, libraries. That's where a lot of also immigrant community members 
you know, go to access a lot of resources. We work with businesses. There are a lot of immigrant small business owners. Um, so we, we try everything that we can in our capacity. Um, and um, also while doing all of this, make sure that we are also working with voting rights advocates and, you know, civil rights groups so that we are all on the same page and having these regular conversations to make sure that we're serving our community like, right. Um, so um, I think, you know, it's, a, it's, it's policy can uh, look, you know, one way uh, on paper, but policy in practice is really unique because there's really no formula in terms of how we can run a successful program. So I think all of these efforts are really critical and we do our best to um, you know, just kind of make sure that we understand the pulse of our community and are able to serve accordingly. Great, great, great. Scott, did you want to um, expand upon your answer before? Because I think you answered it a little bit, but if you want to expand upon it now, feel free to sure. uh, educate I us. I, I agree with everything that's been said so far. Uh, I uh, Delivering language support and language assistance right at the point of service on election day at the at the precincts is really the most effective way, but it's also sometimes the most difficult way to get the right people in place that have the right language uh, skills uh, to be able to provide that service. Uh, in California, there's a student poll worker program. And here in Virginia, there's a student page program. Uh, I learned uh, several years ago that these students uh, can be the secret weapon, can be the secret source of, uh, of language skills that we're not able to get uh, by recruiting in the larger community. Uh, these, these students who come from uh, uh, multilingual families are both fluent in English and also in the target language. And they're, they're very, very comfortable and they're willing to serve. Uh, one of the challenges with getting uh, older uh, folks who uh, speak the language to serve is that they have other time commitments uh, or, or they don't have the confidence in, uh, in their ability or it's a really, really long day. Uh, but students uh, are sort of the antidote uh, for that. So anyone who has a student poll worker program uh, of, of any sort should try to focus on uh, at least identifying language capabilities within the group and maybe even uh, recruiting specifically for, uh, for language proficiency. Uh, in terms of uh, working with community groups, uh, yeah, it's most community groups from my experience tend to be regional rather than uh, you know, county by county or jurisdiction uh, oriented. So it, it's really difficult for their membership who spans multiple counties to you know, volunteer to, to, to serve. But, what I've found is a, an effective way to work with these communities is to identify which ones and which people within those organizations are that trusted messenger to, to the community and to uh, foster a relationship with those trusted messengers and give them uh, the information that, that they need to pre prepare materials for them and to have them be the ambassadors uh, uh, with the me whatever message we're, we're, we're trying to get out to, to these communities. And I would second what Heider said earlier about using uh, 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 media sources. There are niche uh, uh, media for all of these populations. Sometimes it's radio, sometimes it's TV, sometimes it's printed material. And that can be an effective way of, of reaching out to them because mainstream uh, media might catch the younger population, but my experience is, is generally the older population that has difficulty in with their English proficiency. Right, I get it. I totally get it. Um, how did language assistance change because of the pandemic, and did this affect voter turnout? Uh, Lorena, can we start with you? Sure. Um, of course, you know, the personal interaction uh, definitely uh, wasn't there. However, you know, we began uh, conference calling and what we're doing now uh, through uh, the social media, the uh, Zoom calls, it, it definitely changed the landscape, but we continue to communicate and, uh, you know, the community outreach, because we've been doing it for so long, thankfully, it wasn't lost. It wasn't lost in all the uh, 
the chaos that was going on last year, to, to put it lightly, um, uh, you know, the community still needed information. The community still needed us to explain what's new. So public speaking events, uh, you know, changed to what we're doing now. And, you know, we know it's uh, very important to continue that. So we did what we could to continue it during up to the election. It, it, it was difficult and less frequent, uh, uh, you know, two months before the election, but we did do our best. Uh, Joe uh, is uh, very aggressive in making sure we do participate, and we love it because they're a great partner. I, I can't say enough good things about them. We are very privileged to have numerous uh, organizations that are powerhouses in the community, and we not only have the community, but we have in-house um, folks that are not only translators, but they also work with the community leaders. And we share our translations and what's on our website to counties that may not have what we have as far as resources. So that's important to, um, to reach out to your counties if they are, uh, for example, we have a county, it's not a requirement for them to have it in uh, their election materials in Spanish, for example, but they want to proactively do that. And because we have the resources, we do help them with the translation uh, without any charge. Um, so sharing our knowledge, sharing uh, what we have is also very effective throughout our state and with other counties, not just uh, within Clark County. So right. it, it, it's Great. been very effective. Pandemic didn't stop us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great to hear. Hyder? I think obviously with the in-person interaction being gone, and for the most, most part of 2020 at least, um, those, those massive events, you know, going out, being in those things I was mentioning before were gone. Um, our, our adapting to it was, who is the leading voice in this whole process of the pandemic? And, and it became clear to me that it was the county, right? The county was the one telling us what was the uh, mask or no mask policy or social distancing or opening or not or what capacity. So people were, at least in my opinion, that's how I perceived it, turning towards the county, right? This is going to become my trusted leader voice, lead, leading voice. And so we kind of attached ourselves to it. So even the small things, like if we wanted to put information out, we would put it in social media, but make sure the county in tandem was retweeting or quoting it or even using their account and us retweeting theirs, you know, so that kind of people are going for this official channel people are really paying attention to this channel then let's use or let's try to focus on that channel so that we can um, get to through this whole you know what is going on period um, attached on that that very effective that very naturally followed voice that that was the county um, and obviously you know within that serious limitation of, of, of uh, in-person activities there were there were still groups of um, voter uh, registration. We call them deputy voter registrars here in Texas, people who go out and get certified to be uh, registrants, if you will, right? So you, you have to uh, be accredited as a voter deputy registrar to be able to go, be able to go out and register voters. Um, some of them still were doing efforts of going door to door or dropping a form. So again, making sure that we were aware who those people were, who were still being able to do these little uh, in person or community or whatever form of event and say, let's, let's use that effort, let's attach on to it. Uh, if we detected that the community was responding to and finding a trusted voice in it, besides ours, obviously, but um, again, times require that you adapt to them, right? So I think that was, that's the main, the main change that we had um, was finding those trusted voices and, and using them and clinging on to them and saying, would you replicate my message? Because we noticed that people are really paying attention to you right now. Great, great, Scott. Well, uh, every part of the county and every or part of the country and, and every state had its own strategy for uh, getting people to vote and and uh, boosting turnout in their own jurisdiction. And in, in California, the the preferred way of doing that was voting by mail. And uh, all the counties mailed all their voters uh, vote by mail ballot prior to the election. We mailed out seven hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, ballots to, to voters. 
And we knew from experience and from data and academic research that our minority communities uh, voted by mail in lower percentages than uh, the, than the majority community. Uh, and we knew that it was uh, uh, going to be a challenge to influence that, those groups to uh, vote their vote by mail ballot rather than endanger themselves by voting in person. Uh, so we brainstormed how can we uh, communicate the, the importance of, for this one election, you know, you should vote the ballot that, that you were mailed. And uh, we did the traditional things with the trusted messengers and the community groups and, and that, but we didn't feel like the message would, would still get out. So uh, we uh, professionally produced some PSAs uh, to encourage, uh, that targeted these populations, these language minorities and, and ethnic minorities, uh, that targeted them specifically and asked them to vote the ballot that they were mailed. Uh, and the cool thing about doing this, although the, the production was professional, the actors uh, were all members of, of the staff. You know, we had a very diverse staff and uh, uh, we had uh, many API uh, staff members. We had African-American staff members. We had Hispanic staff members. And we were able to recast these, uh, our staff into the messengers. And we worked with Comcast and did a, a, a targeted media campaign uh, and we had over 500,000 uh, commercials during the four week period of time. We used some of the grant money that we received to, to defray the cost. And uh, when all was said and done, uh, only 10% of the voters that voted in a record turnout year actually voted in person. So it worked. We were able to reach these populations. They, they accepted our message, they acted on our message and we felt that that was a, a, a very, very successful uh, way of doing it and a model that that would be handy uh, in other jurisdictions uh, in the future. Great, great, Shinoba. Yeah, um, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, we were in the same boat like everyone else. Uh, we, uh, in the past, we've uh, mostly focused on direct engagement. Um, and as Lorna said earlier, uh, we also have in-house staff that is dedicated to this outreach year-round, um, especially for languages that are required um, under the Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act. Um, so in the past, most of our work uh, had focused on direct engagement uh, with some digital outreach as well. Uh, but given the critical year 2020 was and you know that we had to administer elections in the midst of this global pandemic, um, along with um, services, you know, such as expanded vote by mail, uh, curbside voting, um, secure drop boxes here, um, you know, several locations across the city. Um, our communications team, um, you know, as Scott mentioned, also along with the community services division, worked really hard. Um, uh, and, um, you know, under the leadership of our commissioners and management, everybody had to sit together and brainstorm in terms of how could we uh, accomplish, you know, this, um, this goal. So over the several months in 2020, uh, we had to pivot from mostly in-person outreach to putting together and sharing a lot of updated election information um, through community partners, um, student groups that were more digitally connected um, through social media platforms, through ethnic media, you know, uh, media in general, radios, or you know, whatever we could, uh, you know, whoever we could connect with uh, to engage voters. And while we also had to comply with the COVID-19 safety guidelines, right? So uh, there was definitely a lot more um, notices and flyers and multiple languages and website updates just keeping up with the updates in terms of what's what's a, the new deadline or you know what's coming up next where are the dropbox locations and what are the early voting sites what are the hours um how can you request a vote by mail ballot even though we also mailed um you know thousands of vote by mail ballots and even multilingual ballots to voters uh, especially in targeted precincts where we do provide language access 
So we had, you know, um, social media posts in multiple languages. There was online training provided for poll workers this time because poll workers could not attend in-person training. So even though, you know, I'm sure the experience was not the same, but for returning poll workers, you know, it was uh, helpful to have the online training and for new poll workers as well um, to be able to access uh, the training online. Um, because <clears throat> as Scott mentioned earlier, it's a long day. They have to show up at 5 a.m., open the polling place, administer elections throughout the day, you know, tabulate at the end of the day. Um, so all of that, I think, um, offering online training was also very helpful, and that was for everyone. Um, and um, there were definitely a lot of virtual webinars. You know, I am a part of this team. I work with the South Asian community, and I know how challenging that was and uh, the amount of work and prep that went into it. But I think um, it was also helpful, as I mentioned earlier, recruiting a lot of um, young poll workers, because what we learned in 2020 was, uh, and, you know, understandably so, a lot of our seniors were concerned for their health, you know, and uh, so a lot of our um, returning poll workers are often seniors, but 2020 changed that. So they were hesitant, they were concerned about, you know, their safety and health. So we had a lower um, uh, turnout for our returning senior poll workers, for example, for the age bracket of 65 to 74, I think we had, uh, you know, it dropped from over 16% to a little over 11% in 2020, uh, as compared to 2016. Uh, however, um, that bridge was thankfully, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you know, that gap was uh, filled with younger poll workers. So we had high school poll workers between the age of 16 to 24, our young poll workers actually were really enthusiastic enthusiastic and understood the need. Uh, and they showed up uh, and signed up in larger numbers. So that number for the age group of 16 to 24 uh, in 2016 uh, was a little over 19% went to like over 26% in 2020. So I think that was really helpful um, because I think it wasn't just the election um, agencies, but it was also our community that came together to make the year, you know, uh, at least to make sure that the process uh, uh, goes on smoothly. Um, so that, and that came because of these years of investment in our community, because we've developed those relationships. We do have that trust and we have those trusted messengers, including our own staff and you know community members that we've worked with over the years. Um, and I think all of that uh, was uh, evident um, in terms of how the community came together and worked with us. And to answer your set, the second part of your question, I think uh, most Asian Americans uh, I, is that, you know, we all know like anyone else and do have opinions uh, one way or the other, um, you know, uh, but when it comes to electoral engagement, but 20, in 2020, we saw that this enthusiasm was even higher. Um, you know, voters of Chinese and Indian and um, Korean and Vietnamese and Japanese and, you know, Filipino communities, um, they were, you know, all enthusiastic as compared to uh, some of the previous elections. And this is just based on our engagement. Um, and uh, we just locally, we saw that. And I think to be able to make sure that turnout um, is greater, um, these, these different means of, in terms of adapting or pivoting from in-person to virtual, I think was very critical and uh, and proved very helpful. Uh, so there was no slowing down. Uh, there was no time to slow down. Uh, we just had to buckle up and deliver um, as things changed. Uh, and uh, I think uh, for most of us, um, it was a challenge that we'd never seen before, but we were able to get through it. And uh, it just seems like, and just based on community feedback, I think it went really well. But at least we were able to do our part to assist our voters. Great, great. Chairman, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Well, thank you, Vice Chair Hicks. Uh, we, we probably have time for one more question. Um, you know, with the new census, I think we're all anticipating the new results for uh, localities and what language they'll be supporting uh, or providing services. You all have a wealth of experience. We just spent a, a great deal of time talking about how you serve the community. But there'll be some new jurisdictions that will be providing language uh, services, language translation services. Um, could you each give me one recommendation that you would provide to a new county or a new locality that will be providing language assistance um, after the new census numbers come out? And we'll start with, uh, why don't we start with uh, Shabana? Oh, sure. Um... <clears throat> 
I, I would honestly have more than one. <laughs> oh, I, I know, I know. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason I say that is because uh, we are anticipating an increased, you know, voting eligible population, even in our jurisdiction. And, you know, of course, for others as well. And uh, we will need uh, continued and even expanded services to help voters. Um, there are cultural barriers, there are linguistic barriers. And that's where um, our years of experience, um, collaborations and partnerships matter. Uh, there are some very successful programs to model after. So I think all of that uh, is key in terms of all of us to come together and uh, work collectively. Uh, we still have, at least for the Asian American community, this cha challenge. The sad part is we also carry that unfair burden of being seen as the model minority, which is not true. Um, we do have community members and eligible voters who live in poverty and they lack education and they struggle due to lack of language skills. And uh, we cannot really compromise with the programming that we have uh, put together over the years. So just based on some of this experience, I think for us as election agencies, this is our opportunity to come together. Um, it will require a renewed sense of responsibility um, to take on our increased responsibilities. But I think we have, we definitely have programs that we can model after. And actually we could, we should also consider maybe working together um, to put together some language access best practices. Uh, I know I remember discussing that with Commissioner Hicks uh, a couple of years ago when I was there for the Language Access Summit, uh, I think, you know, um, uh, EAC uh, recommendations are like, you know, my, uh, I would say, resource in terms of when I need guidance. So this is a great opportunity for us to also consider maybe working together to put together some language access best practices uh, that can be beneficial for other election agencies across the country. Well, that's true. And, and Shabana, that's one reason we want to do uh, videos like this so the new counties that are that are under section 203 or decide to provide services they have a sort of a head start I, I found in Virginia for example that when counties had somebody to talk to larger counties with larger counties medium counties medium it was really a great resource and um, so I, I'm very hopeful that this will be a great resource for counties Hyder what do you what are the one or two recommendations you would provide uh, you know, just to get, we're getting the context from different folks for new counties that uh, might be new to this and um, anticipate providing services effectively for the first time. I would say just prep yourself for something that is bigger than just translating what you have. Um, it's a much more broader problem than that. It's a technical problem. Make sure your website, your printers, uh, your computers, everything handles the characters of a different language. If you have to support Hindi, Russian, Chinese, I mean, sometimes you're, su you're surprised to know, oh my God, I can't print that with this, you know, 15 year old uh, voting machine I have. Uh, make sure you understand it's an organizational issue. You may need to have new people in your office who are dedicated to tasks that are more than just commission or translation and then print it on your you know, in your book, uh, make sure you understand it's a, it's a, there's a, a social component to it. You know, again, everything we've been talking about, how do you identify these communities? Um, uh, if you speak Spanish, I'm bilingual native Spanish speaker, which Spanish are you going to use to translate? Um, you know, which one resonates more with your community? Because you can have someone from Spain, someone from Mexico, someone from Argentina, and they're gonna be substantially different. So it's not, it's much more broader, right? So if you are like, it, I think that's gonna be my situation here in Tarrant County, receiving a lot of influx from people moving around and you're already thinking we're probably gonna have to support uh, one or more languages. Um, it's much broader than that. And, and there are people like Scott, like Shabana, like Lorena that have been dealing with this for a longer time and at least reach out. And I, I'll, I'll subscribe to what Shabana was saying, reach out to at least say, hey, what, which things that you trip over the first couple of times so I don't do that at least, right? And I find my own um, challenges. There are a lot of best practices already out there, but yeah, uh, that's my one statement for you. It's more than just translating material. It's a lot more than that. Lorena, how about you? What, what would be the, uh, the top one or two recommendations for a new county uh, providing services? It's, as everyone is, you know, uh, saying it, proactive work. So being proactive, knowing your community is very important because, you know, for example, just 
uh, we have, you know, English, Spanish, and Tagalog, but we know eventually where we will have uh, another language, and it could be character-based. We work very closely with our budget office. We tell them way ahead of time what's coming. We will need to hire someone, certify an individual. We, we do not use Google Translate, so we do want someone extremely proficient to uh, translating materials. But in essence, being proactive is very important because it, it Heider would point it out, you know, it's not only your system, it's not only your software, it's, you know, lining up the funding. Funding is uh, sometimes not as available in some counties as others. So it's important that you work with your budget, with grants, with anything that's available to kind of get a, a, a head of the game and know and uh, list out, you know, I need one person, I need two people uh, to be in the office. We're going to need to uh, hire additional people for, um, you know, the language uh, during early voting, during election day, for the hotline. So all that is budget-based as well. Uh, it's a very important uh, friendship we have with budget. We have been telling them, I mean, for years that this is coming and we need to be prepared to do that. Um, we, when we first started uh, with the Spanish language, I'll go back to 2002, I believe, yes, 2002, we also relied on the EAC glossary. We started off uh, with uh, using the EAC glossary as well as with the Tagalog language. So it's important to know your resources. Uh, we, you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time, and that will save you time and stress. And, of course, community leaders, uh, we immediately met with them. We identified them. We have identified Chinese leaders already. Uh, we met with them prior to 2016 even. So it's important to be proactive. In essence, be proactive. Uh, it may seem overwhelming because everything has to move so fast, but I think if you have some items and, of course, use your resources, use us. Uh, we are open to talk to anyone that needs assistance or has any questions on how do we start, what's step one, what's step two. So uh, we definitely are available for that. Mm -hmm. Scott. Well, we've been talking about the uh, AAPI community today as, as recipients of services uh, pertaining to voting, but uh, my experience has been with my staff that the AAPI community are also those that render those services, that give those services. Uh, so my advice to a county who has to deal with this for a first time is to look at your staffing and build diversity into your staff. If you've never done this before, there's probably a need to develop some cultural intelligence about the community that you're serving. It, it's very easy for us uh, as uh, overworked election administrators to do things to just check the box uh, and to say we did. Uh, I think it's really important to make the services that we provide really meaningful uh, for the, the intended uh, recipients. And one of the ways, probably one of the most important ways is to have that cultural intelligence in your in your team uh, to, to help inform you as to what, uh, you know, what's appropriate, what, what is different, what's the same. Uh, because as, as much as we like to think that, you know, we might be open-minded and, and uh, multicultural in our perspectives, we, we all have blind spots. So having people on your team to uh, cover those blind spots, I think is essential to anyone uh, who's been doing this or anyone who might be doing it for the first time. Well, this has been very helpful. The EAC, really our mission is to really assist those counties that, are, that may be um, coming under the coverage of the Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act or other provisions and, and really assisting them in that transition to providing the services. Thank you for uh, celebrating Asian Americans and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Um, and adding this, this uh, information to our viewers about what the, the election community is providing in these services uh, to uh, your citizens. 
Um, thank you very much for joining with us. Um, once again, thank you for, for doing this for us. Thanks. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.